Thank you everyone. My name is Alison Konachek. I'm from the Improvement Foundation. Today with us we have Dr Andrew Knight and Professor Susan Carroll. So I'll hand it over to the both of you. Thank you. Thanks very much Alison and welcome everyone. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Sue. I'm thinking back, Sue, that I think we well, we met professionally back in the early 90s when I was um, in general practice in the Upper North Shore of Sydney and, and I think you were then a geriatrician at, at Hornsby, I think you're still a geriatrician at Hornsby Hospital um, and I know that um, you've had a lot of involvement, really a practical on the ground involvement with general practice in that role but also in your role on the south coast of New South Wales. Um, so um, we, our paths crossed again most recently when Sue was involved in an, an expert reference panel uh, putting together some measures. How do you measure the quality of care that you're providing in your practice? We have a group of experts around the table trying to nut that out. It's not an easy task. Um, and one of the things that Sue brought to our attention was this resource is producing called the 410 Essentials of Good Dementia Care. And it struck me as a very useful tool that will allow us to um, systematise the um, care we provide in our practices um, along the lines of the, the, the approach we've been taking in the improvement and you know, really looking at our practice systems and our processes. I'm not going to keep talking, I'm going to hand over to you Sue because I know you've got some uh, a lot of very useful stuff to cover. In so thanks Sue, over to you. Thanks, thanks Andrew and, and hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm talking about dementia today. So, Alison, if I can have the next slide. Dementia is the sort of catch-all name for the syndrome of, of progressive um, memory loss, uh, loss of intellectual function, um, changes in personality and behaviour, but they all cause a significant impairment in function. So you can have memory loss, if you like, without problems in function, and that's not a dementia. So in Australia, um, next slide please, in Australia the commonest cause is Alzheimer's disease by a long way and I would remind you we still don't know what causes Alzheimer's disease and we don't have a cure. Vascular dementia and mixed dementia are also pretty common in, in our older patients. Don't forget dementia with Lewy bodies. If you have Lewy bodies in your substantia nigra you get Parkinson's. If you have them in your cortex you get dementia with Lewy bodies. And then to a lesser extent Parkinson's disease with dementia and some of the rarer ones but most of the time we're talking about those top three or four. So um, what do we have to, oh, what do we know about the, the dementia in Australia? It's, it's common, um, it is now the second highest cause of death after heart disease in Australia. About 350,000 people with it at the moment heading for 900,000 in uh, about 2050. But what's important is the weight increases with age. At 85, one in three people will have dementia. At 90, it's one in two. Don't forget the young ones, people under the age of 65 with dementia. There's probably around 25,000 of those. And they're mainly, they mainly have Alzheimer's disease. So um, next slide, um, what do we have to help us manage? And I've got two things up here on this slide. There are clinical practice guidelines that were released earlier this year and the um, web page is, is there. Um, you just Google um, clinical practice guidelines in dementia and they'll come up. But what I particularly want to talk to the, about today is the second um, document on this slide, which is this 14 essentials for, for good dementia care in general practice. And these, I think if you take this, laminate it, leave it on your desk and follow this, these, um, these 14 essentials are very much a, a distillation of what's in the guidelines and it's evidence-based in practice. So um, next slide please. I want to um, talk today about um, and, and, and illustrate how to use 14 essentials. Sorry, I can't. That's it. So I want it. This is a true story um, from um, down the coast. Um, other than the name change, 82-year-old lady recently moved into your area to a retirement village with her husband. 
On her history of she's got a history of mild hypertension and osteoarthritis. Appears cognitively intact, but her husband, who's also at the meet at the um, appointment, comments that her memory's been failing. Mrs. Brown really bristles at this and says, "No, it's just the move, and there's nothing wrong with my memory." And she declines any even brief testing at the time, but you arrange a further appointment. So um, next slide. Um, that's where the first couple of points on the 14 essentials come in. And I think this is really, really important. When a person or the family raise concerns about memory or cognition, don't dismiss it as old age because it usually isn't. And it takes three years on average for a diagnosis of dementia to be made currently in Australia because we are often ignoring that first warning. So be alert to cognitive decline particularly in your over 75 year olds, but, but certainly think about it. So what we need to do when we see Mrs. Brown next is look at history um, and then actually look at her cognition. So you, you ease into it with Mrs. Brown talking about a general health and a blood pressure because you know she's not happy to talk about her memory. Um, on physical examination, she's got a slightly elevated systolic blood pressure, scores 22 out of 30, problems with short-term memory, she can't remember any of the three words you've given her and she has no idea of day, date, month, even year. So you talk to a husband who said that she's now having trouble cooking or she'd always be he is a little worried about, um, about her driving. So we've, we've decided she clearly has cognitive decline. Um, but we need to look at what the cause is. And here, as it says, 0.7, um, you, it's most likely to be Alzheimer's disease. Now, when we did the investigations and the CT scan, we did that to rule out any reversible causes. Pretty rare, but um, the, um, I think it's very important just to make sure that there aren't, maybe there isn't a meningioma in the brain or some unusual um, blood tests. So it's important just to be um, aware of that. So with Mrs. Brown, we look at, yes, she certainly appears to have an Alzheimer's disease. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and um, as I said, you've, most of the, the uh, investigations are normal. There is more cerebral atrophy on her brain scan than maybe is expected for age and white matter ischemic changes. Most people of her age will have those sorts of changes. Um, because her daughter came with her to that original appoint that second appointment, uh, or to this appointment, sorry, um, she confirms that her mother's act actually been pretty bad for 12 months and the recent moves made things a lot worse. So this um, allows you to bring up the diagnosis of, of possible early dementia um, with her and her family. And I think it's really important to take the positive view where you emphasise that, you know, yes, she has short-term memory problems and things aren't going too well, but um, most of her brain's working well and you encourage her to do things um, that will keep her brain active, like um, memory, like a memory, te a memory um, games, but particularly word puzzles, um, those sorts of things, certainly playing card games, things like that. Um, next slide, please. So it's quite interesting, the, the business of informing the patient and family of the diagnosis. Very occasionally, some people will say they don't want to know, but I've only had that happen once or twice um, in my um, clinics. And look, I'm seeing 15 to 20 new patients a, uh, a month. It's interesting because most of them have, a, have an inkling that something's going on. And I think it's important to broach it carefully. I use the words, you have a touch of Alzheimer's, but point out that most of the brain's working well and that there's lots of things we can do about it. Um, so that brings me um, to discussing key issues with the family. And legal issues in this case are really important. I, do, I suggest to everybody that they have enduring guardianship, and enduring power of attorney. So guardianship is your, your lifestyle decisions, healthcare, medical consents, accommodation, um, services. Enduring power of attorney is legal and financial affairs. Two separate acts of parliament, two separate legal documents, but 
most people do them together, to think about doing their will, that's important, and also to think about advanced care directive, what would they want at the end of life. This might be something I might broach at that um, second or third visit, but maybe mention later on. And the important thing is the enduring guardian knows what happens. Um, next slide, please. Um, driving. Now, this is something that comes up again and again and is, is a real issue. It is very clear that uh, what should happen when someone has a diagnosis of dementia. And the Austro guidelines say it. If you have a diagnosis of dementia, then you should only have a conditional licence, which means a licence with restrictions of one sort or another. And that can depend a lot on the nature of the driving task. Do they live in a country town and need to drive into town and back? If they're living in a city, in the city and they're driving during school times, um, then I'd be very careful about that sort of thing if you are worried about their driving. Certainly driving daylight hours, um, and the most common restriction is within five or ten kilometres of, of, of their home address. Clearly in the country that might be 20 or 30 kilometres, depending on what is needed. An on-road assessment, so the sort that's done by NRMA um, or by the, um, the driver training, the driver licensing authority, um, is the gold standard. There really is nothing better than having an on-road test to decide whether someone can and cannot drive. And particularly with men who get very upset when you talk to them about their driving. Um, if you say, they say, but I've never had an accident and I drive really well, I say, well, you can prove it to me by having this, have this test, um, do this on-road driving test, and they'll tell us whether you're good or not. And usually that's the best way to manage things. Um, so next, next slide. Um, so what's the current treatment recommendations for Alzheimer's disease? There is very good evidence for physical exercise. Um, currently we say aerobic exercise, so walking 20 to 30 minutes a day, five times a week. But also now there's evidence for um, resistance training, so light weights, um, say two or three kilogram weights from Kmart or the kettle and do upper body exercise whenever they go and have a cup of tea. If you can build it into their lives, it makes it much easier and certainly the walking is really important. Mental exercise is also important. Um, we talk about you know, Sudoku, crosswords, um, any of the card games. Certainly computer games are good and Tetris remains probably the standout in terms of probably benefits to lots of areas of the brain. Um, vitamin E, there is good evidence, randomised controlled trial evidence that vitamin E at 2,000 international units daily slows functional decline in Alzheimer's disease. Um, that was published a couple of years ago and, and sits on top of a, a trial from about 20 years ago which so, showed similar findings. So vitamin E at 2,000 international units daily is fine for most people. Then we come to the symptomatic treatment um, and we're looking really at the cholinesterase inhibitors, um, three of them, Dinepazil, Rivastigmine and Galantamine, they've been available since about 2001. They have a modest effect on symptoms. They do not change what's happening in the brain, although there is evidence it's that people who've been on them appear to progress more slowly, but we don't have randomised trial evidence for that. Um, if someone in the early stages, I would definitely suggest Dinepazil or Rivastigmine, which comes as a patch as well, and Galantamine, one of those three. Um, in the much later stages, Mamantine, Ebixa, can be very useful, for, particularly for people who are anxious um, or agitated, as it really does seem to calm them. These drugs can be given together, but currently under the guidelines for um, prescribing, only Veterans Affairs patients can get both subsidised. Um, if you're just on PBS, it's one or the other. So we generally recommend start with one of the cholinesterase inhibitors and see how how you go and then perhaps later in the disease substitute or, or add on on a private script. Um, it's important to know that about a third of people who have cholinesterase inhibitors do well, a third stabilise and a third it does nothing at all. Um, and you never know which particular um, uh, category your patient will fall into so it really does become a trial um, to see what, what goes on. And 
while we use the mini mental state examination to show if there's been an improvement and in theory a two point improvement is significant, you don't actually have to do that now as long as there's been clinical improvement um, then the patient can continue the medication because it's a lot less expensive than it was when it was first introduced when it was $160 a month. Now it's $40 or $50 a month maximum. Um, so yes, those they're very useful. So um, with Mrs. Brown, um, oh, we've sort of gone around a bit here. But um, yeah, we've discussed a lot at the appointment when her daughter's there and it's always good to arrange a follow-up appointment in a few weeks to see how much has, has gone in. Um, in with this particular case, because this lady lived in the country, the GP spoke to me on the phone. We confirmed that Mrs Brown most likely had dementia, which meant that we could go through these prescribing um, um, the, the trial of one of the cholinesterase inhibitors. Okay, um, so developing, oh, we've developed the care plan hopefully and it's very important I think to give families an idea that or, or give them the idea that this is a progressive disease but usually it progresses very slowly. I certainly encourage people to get stuck into their bucket list um, make sure they've done all the legal and financial um, things, they've got power of attorney, um, they can probably continue to drive for a while, think about moving if they're living say a long way out of town or in a huge two-storey house um, to start making plans um, for the future. I think it's also important to refer to Alzheimer's Australia. They are the main advo advocacy group for people with dementia in Australia and they run fantastic courses. They're living with memory loss or living with dementia course which they run for the person with dementia and their carer is really terrific um, and, and is certainly a great way to, to let people know how to cope into the future. They also have a very good helpline with counselling and they run a number of community services. Um, so I think I would like to stop there. Um, we've done, as we said, we've, we've decided on um, treatment with Dinepazil. We organised the prescription right on at the MMSE score of 23 out of 30. Think about side effects, most likely with Dinepazil to be muscle cramps and diarrhoea, although pretty unusual at the low dose. And we've told um, Mr Brown and the daughter and their daughter to think about contacting Alzheimer's Australia. Um, so has anyone got any questions or, or queries? Um, we do say regularly review the care plan and I think that's something that you would do um, every six months. We're going to be checking her blood pressure um, and how things are going generally. But it's this can be a very slow, slow progress. So I see people um, who, I'm seeing people now who I've seen 10, 12 years ago and they're progressing to the stage where they're needing more assistance and perhaps looking at residential care. But particularly if you manage all their other um, illnesses, in this case particularly Mrs Brown's hypertension, um, often the disease can progress quite slowly, particularly if they take on board the exercise um, and you know, take their vitamin E and do, the, do their, um, their mental exercise as well as their physical exercise. So Andrew, so, I might that, hand back to you. Yeah, look, that, that's fabulous. What I love about those 14 points is it, it, allow, it allows us in practice to set up a call and, and to start designing pathways for people. So I don't know if anyone who's been listening has and it has done any work amongst their dementia patients. If you have, perhaps you could type something into the pain, pain and we might be able to unmute you and hear from you. Um, I've got a question about, about driving. Where I work, um, where I have been for some years, it, it usually seemed to be involved, involved getting people to see a, an occupational therapist at the local hospital. There was a long wait, it was quite difficult. But you seem to be saying that the NRMA can do it or the local motor registry service can do it, the RMS can do it. What, what are the sorts of options and what do you normally use? 
Um, the occupational therapy option is quite good, but I tend to use it for people who've had a stroke or who have some some subtle problems. It's also about five hundred dollars, unless you can get it, you know, to, uh, through the the local public hospital. So it can be um, quite difficult for people on the pension. What we find locally, both in Hornsby and um, where I work down the coast, is that you can speak to um, a driver, the driver training school, and their um, instructors. There's often two or three of them who are who have done the training for um, assessing older people because that's who does a lot of the on-road assessments for the Roads and Maritime Service in New South Wales now. And the cost is around $69, $70, $75 rather than $500. And it is a mixture of um, on-road, of, of, of say on-road instruction and then actually a test. And when I asked one of the driving instructors, you know, d is he a bit soft with them? He just looked at me. Um, I use that very regularly now. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good tip. We've got a question here from Lisa Gilbert about diagnosis, and I think this is really important because, you know, once it's clear, it's clear. And I, I think a lot of GPs are, are a bit nihilistic about the diagnosis and don't want to make it in some ways because there's a sense of, fit, of impotence or, or inability to make a difference. So, but Lisa, you can see that question there, Sue. In the chat yes, yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, uh, actually a, a, an almost normal CT scan is, is evidence of Alzheimer's disease. Um, what you often see is cerebral atrophy, but we all, we all lose brain cells from about the age of 18. So all of us will have some cerebral atrophy. And often radiologists will comment um, more than would be expected for their age. The other thing that intrigued me as we discussed before the session was um, the, the view about treatment, and uh, I think you said this lady actually did quite well on the, on on Donna Pazel. So I might take the opportunity there, Alison, to just say uh, if you've got any more, if you've got another question, you can quickly type it in. But um, I might just hand back to Alison. I want to say thank you, Sue. Thank you for your work on this resource. I think it's an absolutely brilliant resource, and actually helps us to operationalise in practice. I think we could establish a register. We could look at the way we could actually do some work with our clinicians in our practices to uh, work on early diagnosis and have a, a protocol in place to make sure that all the appropriate investigations are done. I think there's opportunity there also to look at treatment and to make sure that our treatment is optimised for all our dementia patients. So in terms of getting uh, reducing variation and providing the same care to populations within the practice, which is what we're moving to in general practice, I think there's a lot of food for thought there and be very interested to hear if others uh, do any work on that or have some, some comment on that. Uh, exciting session coming up next time in September. Uh, Roz is a particularly good speaker uh, about systems. Um, Alison, do you want to make some comments? Um, yes, this is, Roz did a QI community webinar in last month and she started talking about um, nurse clinics and how to set them up. So this is actually the implementation. Um, any of our Previous webinars are available on YouTube um, and I can send details out. This webinar has been recorded and will be available um, along with the slides and I can get those to everyone that attended today. Uh, we do have some paid um, online seminars um, coming up in the next month and there are just a few that are on, the, on your screen now. And to register or find out more, please visit our website. Um, and of course, with any webinar we do, we do like your feedback. So there will be an evaluation form um, coming up at the close of this webinar. And I'd like to again thank Susan and Andrew for um, pulling together what was a very informative um, session. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs>